you're in a position hey. to update all your dependencies and all your tools, uh, the build tool and, and even the Jenkins server maybe, but if you can update all these things, then you have a very high chance that you won't even notice the update very much. So, so the Java update would, uh, would then come last in that list. If by the time you down, you worked all the, uh, uh, down the list and you updated everything else, and you then update Java to Java 11, for example, then you're likely not to encounter any problems, or you have a fair chance. Because if you're using mainstream uh, technologies, then all of them had, have Java 9 or Java 11 compatible versions out there, Spring, for example, and unit testing frameworks and IDEs, and basically all the things that you're using a lot, um, they have Java uh, 9 or 11 compatible versions out there. So you have the chance to do that, that will be the best preparation at all. So you don't even find out whether you had problems in the past. But how do you first find out about uh, whether you have those dependencies, um, uh, dependency problem? Yeah, don't. Don't figure it out. Don't. Okay. Just as to the okay. if, if you have a chance. I mean, right. most projects try to stay up True. to date anyway. So right. if you can just make all the updates yep. and then try to run on 11, then you're just not going to know whether you had any problems and th that's fine. Cool. If you can't make an update or if there is no compatible version, um, then it turns into, okay, what ca precisely can you do? And the best thing you can do is just take your build and just run it on whatever version you want to go to. Most likely now you want to go to 11. So you build on 11 and just going to see what happens. Uh, compilers, because maybe because you use an internal API, or maybe you're going to get uh, runtime er errors because the dependencies the dependency you are using does, uh, does something that doesn't work anymore. For example, log4j1 tries to parse the Java version. And it knows that the Java version starts with one dot. So what it did is was like it just removes the first two characters and then scans the rest. So when Java 9 came out, the version string was just 9. So it would remove the first two characters of 9 and then try to scan the rest, which is an empty string. And so there's a log4j would crash your running application, log4j1. Um, so that's a way to, you will find, figure that out during tests or during integration tests, or maybe even if you have manual tests. So at some point you would figure that out before your customer does that. So really, if you, the better, your um, CI pipeline is put up to test as many things as possible, the better the test coverage is, the, the easier it, uh, is, it gets to just really just bump the Java version and then see if things work. Mm -hmm. and I think that, that's like the proof is in the pudding, that's the best way to go around it. Because there are chances, for example, that maybe Guava uses unsafe and that could be a problem, but maybe you're not using that Guava feature. So knowledge about what specific libraries are causing problems might not apply to your uh, situation. So that's why I would say, go, just, just try it out. Beyond that, there are some tools you can use to get, have a more analytical approach. Mm -hmm. You can use, first and foremost, JDEPS, yep. which uh, since Java 8 is in the bin directory of any JDK, and you can use that for all kinds of stuff. It's a really cool tool. I wrote a blog post about that, where you can just create uh, dependency graphs, for example. That's awesome. You can, at, as output of your build, you can create a dependency graph of all your jars, like the, not something that an architect drew on a whiteboard like six months ago, right? Or six years ago. No, the real actual dependency graph, uh, you can have that output. That is awesome. But you can also use it specifically for migrations. And uh, uh, one big use case is there's a flag called JDK internals. And what you're basically saying is you say, JDEPS, Here's my jar, here are all my dependencies, that make a recursive search for internal APIs and will report which in APIs you're using which are internal. And if you're using any of those, then that means you cannot compile against them on JDK 9 plus unless you add some command line flags. And it also means that you cannot run on them. So that if you take a Java 8 application that uses internal APIs, oh sorry, you can run. If you take a Java 8 application that uses internal APIs and just put it on 9, then you can get away with little few things that you cannot get away when compiling against 9. So the compiler is more aggressive about internal APIs than the runtime. That's made on decision made on purpose to make migration a little bit easier. Then my recommendation is to build on 9 and then you will face these problems anyway. Right. If you need an internal API, for example, uh, you got to find a way around that. Look for replacements. Most likely there are replacements in the JDK. If they are not, look for third party replacements or um, maybe you have to abandon that API and find a different solution. So there are all kinds of ways um, to, to, that depends on the individual problem that you have. But yeah, so uh, JDEPS will report that. Okay, so and uh, for each, so now we are we, we are in the six months release yeah. uh, pattern, but we also, so sometimes, so most of the time features are being added, yeah. but we're, we are also removing features, yeah. right? So if I go from uh, eight to 11, for yeah. example, and I want to figure out like, well, what was released or, yes. uh, Will it cause a problem? Like, for example, the Java EE um, libraries that were yeah. removed. So, how how would you uh, recommend yeah. to go about that? So, first of all, just to make that very clear, yes, mm -hmm. every Java, Java release can remove stuff and and 
unlike in the past, it will actually do that occasionally, but it's not like tomorrow somebody's going to decide that sure. uh, vector was a mistake, which I think most people agree by now we don't need that anymore, we're going to remove vector. That's not the kind of removals we're talking about. It's more like, like fringe uses, small stuff, and it's usually not removed because it's old, it's usually removed because it stands in the way of some other improvement. So for example, um, the whole object finalization thing is somehow a problem. Um, so now the finalizers are slowly phased out because they stand in the way of another improvement. Um, so the main things that go away will have, most application developers will not see them a lot. Like often I read about something that is considered to go, to, to be removed, I'm like, oh wow, I never know what, I don't even know what right, that right, is. Right. I have to read up what is going to be. For example, Java 9 removed uh, the extension mechanism. I had no idea what that was, I had to look that up. So I think that's common that uh, smaller things will be removed. Okay, how do I learn about that? There's a call, tool called JDepper Scan, which works similar to JDeps. You just throw your bytecode at it, and it will then report which deprecated APIs you're using. And since Java 8 or 9, I remember, don't remember at the moment, uh, deprecations can also have a for removal flag. Right. So you will see whether this is just deprecated in general, which does not mean it, it's supposed to be removed. It can mean you should not use this. There are better alternatives. Maybe right. this is unsafe. This is easy to misuse. So there are different reasons for deprecation. Maybe we should ask the doctor deprecator about that. Uh, <laughs> so the different reasons for deprecations. Removal is one of them, but if it's scheduled to be removed, you will see the full removal flag for at least one release in advance. And that means if you run a depra scan from Java 11, it will warn you about what will be gone in 12. Mm -hmm. And that's a great way to figure out what, go, what, will, what will be gone. And then it, the, that's one way to learn what, what's, what's going to be removed in the next release. What if you stay in 11 and you plan to jump to 17? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with intermittent releases? Because if you just build on seven, 11, and then you go to 17, then a bunch of stuff will just disappear without warning. Right. So don't do that. Don't just jump six releases at once. That's for various reasons, it's not a good decision. Um, the minimum amount that, you, that everybody can do is use the JDEPA scan from every intermittent Java release mm -hmm. uh, and run that tool against their code base. I would go a step further and say, even if you don't su publicly support Java 12, Java 13, still build against it. Build against the, 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 the Java version that you publicly support, that you baseline against, and then build against every Java version as it comes out, ideally even early access builds. If you're uh, in a position that is very easy to set up a build, and that's really great, if you're not in that position, it takes a lot of work, then maybe now is the time to improve that process. Like ideally, you just drop a couple of lines into a YAML file, and somewhere, some build server starts uh, an additional build and builds your entire code base then on Java 12, on Java 13. And, and so you can test basically yes. that you don't yeah. have to like deploy in production right. necessarily. Yeah, right. you run, so. yeah, you run not only compile, right. You right. test integration tests, whatever you have, you run all of that. And that's pretty, um, that's pretty manageable because most of these, like for example, we moved uh, from Java 8 to 11 in steps, first to 9, then 10, then 11. But we raised the baseline from 8 to 11 just a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So we built on master, so I would not recommend to do any changes in a branch. Just try to get your master branch to work on both the baseline version and the new version. And since many problems mm -hmm. can be fixed by just updating dependencies, you know, no dependencies, or most dependencies, you can update to a version that works on 11 and still works on 8. Like Spring did not raise the baseline to 11. So I think for the foreseeable future, it will be, will be fairly straightforward to keep one one branch, so the master branch usually, have one branch and build for different Java versions from that branch. What that might mean is that uh, you have to figure out how with Maven or with Gradle or whatever build tool you use, how to put in configuration that is specific to a Java version. Maybe you have to add that flag for on Java 9 or maybe you have to add that dependency on Java 10. Mm -hmm. If you want to do that, then Maven does that with profiles. I don't know, I think as far as I know, Gradle doesn't have a specific concept for this, but you can still do it in Gradle, of course, so that you can figure out how to, to uh, configure your build in a version-specific way. Yeah. Cool. So uh, you you mentioned that already, but I w just want to make yeah. sure um, uh, that that uh, it's well understood. So we really recommend that uh, to move from Java 8 to yeah. 11 or 11 to 17 uh, to to test or to 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 test in between, right? To test yeah. all the the releases. But I just want your so what are the situations where you really need to do that, or do do you for all the projects yeah. do you need to do that? Um so in retrospect, this does not make so much sense. So the talk okay. I gave today, I first go from eight to nine, and then nine to ten, and nine and ten to eleven. This is different reasons. One of them is just historically that's how I started with this, this with the talk, and then in the beginning there was just nine. But also I want to re make really clear that most of the bump, like ninety percent of the problems you're going to face, are due to Java nine. Right. And then ten eleven are really easy. 
And I want to stress that point so people don't feel like, wow, 8 to 11 is so much work. Now 11 to 12 to 13 is going to be as much work. No, it's not going to be. And that's the, that is one of the stress that most of the work is in the first version bump. So that's more like a didactic uh, reason to do it that way. If I would now have a Java 8 application and would have to move it to Java 11, I think it would be perfectly fine to just start on 11 immediately. And if, in, if I never think about any new Java version until in three years Java 17 comes out, I think even there it would make most sense to then just start on 17 and instead of downloading three-year-old or two-year-old Java see. releases. But so what I'm saying is more like if you're looking to the future, if you're in the present and you have Java 12 and you're not, uh, 11, sorry, and you're not looking to the future, then start building on 12 now already. Like 12 early access builds for 12 were out like a month or two before Java 11 was released, and that's really cool. It's a great position to be in that we get so much stuff so early to make sure that to give feedback early, um, and also to like to try things out, particularly important, it's library and framework developers. Um, so they have tons of integration builds to figure out, does Spring still work on 12? Uh, so that's why these early access builds are also early, but uh, even application developers can benefit from that just by giving feedback that something doesn't work to a framework which maybe doesn't have such extensive tests. So I think work hard to make your builds easier to configure and to duplicate so you can easily set up new builds and then just Throw, the, throw each new Java version at that build. This would be my recommendation, yeah. Okay, so you mentioned, um, you mentioned Java 9 and uh, so the, the complexity of moving yeah. to Java 9 because I'm assuming because of the module system Mostly, as well? Mostly, yeah. Right, so, um, so how would you move forward with the module system? So you, I mean, because most of the applications today are built on the class path, yeah. so what, what, I mean, yeah. what, what have you, yeah, maybe it makes sense uh, to really stress that part. So there's a two-step process. The first step is migration from 8, let's say, to 11. That just means getting your code to work as is, meaning on the class mm -hmm. path on 11. And so that's more like a monolithic thing. You cannot really do that well, well in steps. Like either the application works or it doesn't. Right. That's, that's basically the point. Um, if you have a very large project, you can still do migration in steps in the sense that, okay, we s now we just made 200 of our 300 jars work on Java 11, and we just get 100 to, to, to work work on until they're done. But the entire application, at some point, it's either Java 11 compatible or it's not. Right. So that's the first part, migration. The second part is modularization. First of all, that is totally optional. You don't have to create models if you don't want to. Personally, I think you should look into it. I um, didn't write the book about the model system for naught. I think, really think it's, it brings a lot of value to the table, but I see why other people are, are doubting that. And so if you don't see any value in it, then don't do it. Don't do modules if you don't want to. Don't let anybody tell you you have to. <laughs> you don't. Uh, but if you modularize your application, or any other um, project really, but it mostly applies to applications because they're usually a little larger than the average uh, um, library, then you can do that in small steps. You can be partly modularized. You can have modularized just this corner because it makes the most sense there, and, but you didn't modularize the rest yet. So there are features for that, the unnamed module, the automatic module. Um, these concepts are there to allow you a slow migration. Sorry, I didn't want to say that word because migration is the other part, right? A slow modularization, a small, slow move into the module system. Yeah, and I would recommend to do that, by the way. Um, if you think, wow, modularizing this, this application, like putting in module boundaries and all that, that would be so much work, so much reflection work, then I would say that's the exact reason why you want to do it. <laughs> Like, we're, we're having a large project and we're lo actively looking forward to having the possibility to modularize it because we're sure to find places which will just be horrible and painful and intertwined balls of mud. And this pains developers working in those parts every day. They mm -hmm. just kind of got used to it, so it's normal. Like, we know, okay, that project, oh, I don't want to touch that. Like, we even have some projects there that are like a temp suffix, right? So you know somebody created this as a garbage bin, basically, and it grew out of all proportions. And taking that apart will be painful, but we'll benefit from taking that apart. So I'm 100% sure that, well, I'm 90% sure that uh, projects will benefit uh, from even from turning slowly, as small large applications turn slowly into modules, just by virtue of then having to face uh, bad decisions mm -hmm. in the past and a situation that it even now Reduces um, reduces productivity for developers and having to remove those barriers. 
So, um, and uh, so what about you don't want to touch that uh, garbage bin, right? <laughs> <laughs> but then you still want eventually to uh, to move like new functionalities, for yeah. example, to um, to a module system. Yeah. Like because I mean, some uh, like you said, I mean, in some situation it doesn't make sense. Yeah. But maybe if uh, down the road you want to uh, to have more um, microservices, for yeah. example, then maybe new. F um, so what do you think? Uh, what yeah. is your take on it? So first of all, about the garbage bin again. Um, like if you're unscrupulous, you can still put in a j module for Java, then maybe export all the packages and then call it a day, right? So you could still <laughs> technically make it into a module. But then it would still be a garbage bin, right? So right. The, what I was saying, like we're, we're trying to, I think most of things they talk about code quality, like small methods and that kind of stuff, it applies to the module declaration. If you look at the module declaration and it looks like this, that looks good. If you look at the module declaration, it's like this. I think the Java desktop module, for example, has a huge module descriptor. And the Java desktop module is a huge pile of, sorry, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't call swing AWD garbage like in literal sense, but it has like this form of a garbage bin. Let's leave it at that. Beans is in there, AWT is in there, swing is in there. It's all one big ball of mud. And the reason why it's one is because it couldn't be taken apart afterwards without uh, causing serious compatibility issues. So you can still just call it a single module and be done. That was I was saying like, no, work through it, try to make that a good module. It's mm -hmm. a small module descriptor and like a clear, small API surface, that kind of stuff. Uh, do that. It, but still, if you don't want to do that, or if you just say, look, we don't have the time to do that for our 20,000 20, jars, just going to do it for new stuff, that's totally possible as well. Just as um, an automatic module means you put a jar that is not a module onto the module path, and then you can depend on it as if it were a module. So you can start depending on not modularized jars. But the trick also works the other way around. You can take a modular jar and put it onto the class path, and it behaves like a normal jar. Mm. So what that means is you can start modularizing a subsystem, and within that, you get the benefits of reliable configuration, particularly strong encapsulation, something I'm looking forward to introducing to the code base. So you're going to benefit from that in that corner of your world. But during build, doing tests maybe. But if in the end, you end up putting those jars onto the class path, then they will still work perfectly fine there. But you still got at least the guarantees for the compi compilation in that step and for the tests in that subsystem. You still get the model system guarantees, even if in the end, these jars end up on the class path. And at runtime, like at real operations runtime, not at test time, but at runtime, uh, you will not get those benefits out anymore. If the test coverage is sufficiently high, then I think it's a reasonable ex expectation that the live system is not going to behave radically different than the test system. And if that's so, then if the tests work out fine and don't violate the module system's rules, like you, you actually honor strong encapsulation during test time, then you will likely also honor it during runtime, even if you do not have the module system in there before because you put them into the class path. So okay. that's uh, that's one thing. And then you asked about microservices. Uh, I'm not very knowledgeable about microservices. I want to point to a talk by Axel Fontaine. Is the modular monolith? Uh, he's here at the conference. I didn't know where they gave their talk here, uh, but you can look it up. Um, it's uh, what he basically describes is try microservices have a lot of a lot of additional complexity cost. Don't go there initially. Try to have a, a, mo a monolith that is internally modular. Mm -hmm. I think the module system is a great addition here because it makes it much harder to accidentally marry things that should not supposed to be married. So you cannot expect to just take a, a monolith which contains 100 jar mo j modules and then make 100 microservices out of it and just have it work. That's not going to happen. But you can still be sure that you don't have like this intertwined, like all that, all those, right. all those, those, those APIs that are basically married together, which happen a lot between jars. That just like it's really hard to, to pull them apart. So I think if you're well modularized system, then it would be easier to move to microservices <coughs> than with a big ball of mud. But I don't I can't really make an estimate about how much of the way I use I, I did you already go? Did you go just ten percent? Or did you go basically eighty percent and you just have to replace method calls with rest calls? I think it depends on a lot of things that I don't not knowledgeable enough about. But even if it's just ten percent, mm -hmm. still better than zero. Right. Yeah. So you have a blog? Yes, I do. Um, in you blog very often, like every week. Yes, I start again. There, yeah, I start again. So I go in. I go in cycles. Okay. I had a very lazy uh, summer and, and, and late late fall. Uh, sorry, late uh, spring. But yeah, in, since September, I started being more aggressive. I blogged a lot uh, about Java 11 specifically, uh, about some hidden gems in Java 11, but also about how you can write uh, Java scripts meaning script files with Java, which is, I know everybody has been waiting for this. <laughs> so now you can finally write your, like your, write your script to Java. Um, that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's at codefx.org, codefx.org. 
uh, yep. go there. I'll add the link too. Yeah, you'll so. find all the, also on YouTube and already newsletter and Twitter, but there will be, like, links are right. easy to get by, yeah. Thank you so much, Nikolai. Thank you very much, yeah. It was a pleasure yeah, uh, was. having you. Yeah, thank you very thank much. Thank you. See you.